all Christians, whether young, old, male, female, Jewish, Gentile, worldly, carnal, however you want to describe them, all Christians go through challenges, trials, tribulations as it were, experiences of life that brings them to a place of reduction rather than exaltation. Oh, well, they'll be exalted in due time and in due season as the Word of God promises us. But we're told that we must overcome these obstacles that are in our life. We must wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We have to deny ourselves that we have to war against our own flesh. We have to wrestle with our own attitudes. We have to challenge ourselves to find out if we're in the faith at times and re-examine ourselves to see if we're possibly going in the wrong direction at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. That sometimes leads people to despair or to lose hope, to lose confidence in their faith of what God has already done for them. That they somehow lose that devotion because they don't have the emotion of what they felt like when they first fell in love. You know, that first love and when you first got married and how everything seemed like it was just wonderful. Or maybe it didn't. <laughs> you know, kind of six and one, half dozen the other. Depends on your point of view. But when you're in love, you often neglect or ignore lots of things that are still going on. But you don't see them quite as relevant or personally applicable to yourself because you're in love. And you get through that phase and suddenly when you're married for a while, harsh realities come dealing with you in your face. For some people it causes and creates a divorcing of either alienation of affection or emotion or devotion or somehow they run into conflict where they wind up sometimes even divorcing the person they said they would marry forever. I know, I've been there. <laughs> I've gone through a divorce. And it's one of the most frustrating, spiritually aggravating, challenging crucifixion-wise that a Christian can go through because it literally doesn't just involve you, but it involves many people around you. And it involves your soul, so to speak, where it's torn in half. And God hates divorce, but he hates sin, too. And so divorce is no different than sin. It's just simply God hates it, period, because of what it does to you and what the consequences of it are in the future, which is really devastating to so many lives that you don't see the ramifications of it down the road from generation to generation. And so we often... Because sin would abound in these latter days, the love of many would wax cold. And it's not the love only of each other, but the love of God sometimes. That first love, that fire and that passion. You know, the thing that you generate, that you say you do when you put on your earphones and headphones, you know, and try to work up the feelings, you know, or you pray in the spirit to work up the feelings. God doesn't want you to. He wants you to be where you're at sometimes, in that sober-minded state, in that seriousness of being reduced from faith to a simple trust. Sometimes it's just trusting in the Lord and leaving it at that. Sometimes you'll be reduced to the place where you have no great expectation, but you just have a simple trust that, well, sooner or later, God will take care of it. And you just have to let it go and let God. You have to wait on the Lord, not wait in this great, you know, passionate feelings that a lot of times people get when they talk themselves into their faith, you know, some kind of ooh, ah, feeling Jesus, you know, kind of way, but rather a simple 
you've been beaten down so much, you've been stomped on for so long, that really you just trust. You just you just come to a place of simple one scripture type of faith, where you just trust in the Lord. You don't know what's going on. You have no idea how to work it out, but you're just going to trust him until he tells you how. And sometimes that's what you got to do. Sometimes you reduce down to one relationship, one perspective, one faith, one God. And that's the God who sees. Because you know he sees you. He may not be speaking directly to you at this moment for some reason. Maybe you've fallen into sin or you're being tempted by the devil or you come to a place where there's fog all about you or you're packed in with snow all around you. And for some reason you feel like you're all alone. There are times when God does that and allows that to happen in your life so that you could be reduced to trust. Abraham had the same experience. So did David. As a matter of fact, Jesus in Gethsemane experienced it in a short period of time, but on the cross experienced it a lot longer. It really comes to a reliance. We don't use that word reliance because we don't like to think of ourselves as dependent upon anybody or anything. Most Gentiles think of themselves as independent, strong, self-willed, self-determinant. You know, all those things that you put on your resume that say you can do the job. The Bible is the opposite of that. You can't do the job. You can't succeed on your own. You don't have the wisdom and you don't have the knowledge. As a matter of fact, Ecclesiastes pretty much sums up the entire experience of man in the last few sentences. It says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity when it comes to man and his ways. Because man has no answer for himself. The only answers we get, really, are all Christian influenced. If you trace any success in the world, it boils back to somewhere a Christian. Somehow a person that had a relationship with God at some point in time. It always comes back to God because it starts with him and it ends with him. He's called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In between time, you're going to go through a lot of challenges so that you'll have an accurate testimony, a good witness, a lifelong experience of being able to pull from those things that you've gone through and look at someone else who's struggling and say, man, I know. Because you'll be tender-hearted towards that person because you struggled. Now you see, there's also the opposite truth. If you're not struggling and you've never struggled in your Christian walk, I question your faith. I would ask you to re-examine the scriptures and look closely at all Christians throughout history. You have, if you haven't yet, maybe gone astray. And you've gotten into something that may be not what you think it is. If everything's always hunky-dory. Because you see, the bottom line is, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. In other words, this word chasteneth doesn't sound that bad. Because most people really don't understand the word. You know, they have all these ideas of what something means. They don't look it up. They don't, you know, take a dictionary or maybe Google it or, you know, look up some of these old King James words, you know, to understand really where it's coming from or better yet, where it's going. Because that's really what learning is all about, where you're going with what you've learned from experience. You see, a lot of times you get some book knowledge, you know, you, you kind of read something, you go, huh, that's interesting. And then when something clicks, it's like when your personal experience catches up with the book knowledge and you get what's called wisdom because you've applied the book knowledge to your experience in life and you found that it works. And that's what we call wisdom. Wisdom is something that works. Literally, it works. You know, you go, oh, hey, you know what? If I take a hammer and I hit a nail, it works. <laughs> Pretty simplistic, right? Well... Some people, you know, they take hammers and beat all kinds of things with it. But if you put the hammer on a nail, especially a framing hammer, and you use, you know, roofing nails, hey, guess what? You can get a lot done if you know what you're doing. 
one stroke and bam, you can sink that sucker. <laughs> but you see, that comes through experience, training, and knowledge. And that's kind of what life does with you, is that you're going to accumulate experiences, good and bad. But if you have the book knowledge to possibly train yourself in the right way, you'll figure out that very quickly you're going to go from one experience that may be challenging, may cause you to be reduced to simply trusting, may cause you to a place of just simply relying on God, to knowing that, yeah, but I can see the framework. I can see the structure. I can see what he's doing through this. Then you will rejoice in what James calls count it all joy. Because nobody, nobody in their right mind likes suffering. Nobody enjoys, at the time they're going through it, the massive fiery trials that you might be experiencing. But the reality of going through it and passing through it brings out such a precious faith, a tender heart, a willingness to let God be in control, that it's well worth the experience of maybe suffering the loss of all things, that you might gain Jesus in the end. Sometimes that's what people have to experience. Sometimes God allows you to get all these wonderful things you think the world has to offer, and then suddenly they're removed from you to show the reality of your faith, whether it be of God or of man. It's easy to see what men can do. Solomon did it, and in all his wisdom, he came up with the solution of what all of man's accumulated might, power, strength, abilities, sexuality, sensuality, gods, religions, and everything else he tried to experience to find out the end results of it all. And he summed it up with vanity of vanity, all is vanity. That's desperation. But the realization that we have is we don't have to go through vain experiences. We can see a purpose and a design. We can know a plan and a reason why God is taking us through what we experience. So today, when you are going through it, let God do what he wants to accomplish in it for you. Maybe you don't have a lot of faith and a lot of ability to see the structure and the design. But that doesn't mean you can't trust him anyways, or you can't just rely on him in spite of your feelings. You see, sometimes feelings get in the way of having a real devotion to God. But when you experience God in a personal, intimate way, and you go through the experiences with him personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and you come out the other side, you suddenly decide, wow, I never would have experienced this or known him in a more intimate way than I did when I went through the sufferings that he chose for me to bear. That's what we call, take up your cross and follow Jesus.